before we let them on the air, let's cover the news. I said I would spend no more than five minutes covering the news just for them. So uh, without further ado, the news courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. Uh, for start article, star of YouTube abortion video is a horror movie actress, Emily Letts, featured in slasher film about children being slaughtered. Well, as Alex Jones has made it very clear that he is anti-abortion. He is a constitutionalist, and the Constitution Party is um, pro-life, and they are anti-abortion. Some would say that's anti-pro-choice because women should have the right to choose whether or not to get an abortion. I'm not going to really debate that now. I Well, I am kind of indifferent. Uh, if a woman wants to get an abortion, that's a... Uh, that's her right. If she sees the thing as a human parasite, for lack of a better phrase, well, that's her prerogative. People have the right to choose. It's all infinite consciousness anyway. It'll get another chance at life for sure. All right, next article. Kids, kids traumatized have nightmares after cops raid wrong house. Cops give kids stuffed animals to make up for three, hour, uh, for three hours of terror. Cops give kids stuffed animals to make up for three hours of terror. Oh, give me a break. Police brutality again. We don't want a police state, do we? I'm going to plug this show again. Um, well, watch Eddie Craig's video, Secrets Police Don't Want You to Know, on the Alex Jones channel. That'll teach you everything you need to know about what to do when you're confronted by police, especially in a in a car. Uh, but I don't know if it's a brutality case like this. Uh, they might just attack you. But, hey, we got to combat police brutality any way we can. Our next article, uh, Red Lake, woman celebrates a cool abortion on YouTube. Abortion clinic advisor wanted to treasure special memory. I'm not going to bother going about this because I already discussed it uh, two articles ago. Uh, next article, mission accomplished. Libya now scumbag Woodstock. FBI warns new generation of al-Qaeda terrorists threaten America. <sighs> FBI has a lot of nerve, and so does the CIA, to meddle in the affairs of the Ukraine. And now the U.S. government, which publicly runs al-Qaeda, I mean, the FBI, which is part of the government, of course, is now thinks we're so stupid that we're going to believe this lie about al-Qaeda being a threat to America. Well, yeah, al-Qaeda is a threat to America because the U.S. government public runs al-Qaeda. The U.S. government is controlled by the New World Order, which wants, which wants global totalitarian government. Connect the dots. Yeah, it's not that hard. All right, next article. IRS to expand financial surveillance with crackdown on offshore accounts. Crackdown will completely destroy financial privacy. Well, the NSA is already destroying financial privacy. A nice article. Will, will Detroit be the first mayor Chinese city in the United States? Is Detroit destined to become a Chinese city? Well, China is allied with the globalists, the New World Order, the Illuminati bloodlines are heavily uh, allied with China because China's communist government is the kind that they see being opposed on the rest of the world. That's what the New World Order wants. So we should not be against Chinese people of, of, by any stretch of imagination. No, that, that's not the point at all, that we shouldn't be. Chinese people are very cool, yes, but this is about the sign of uh, our jobs being shipped to China and now China's taking over here. And I, look, I don't know the details about this. I don't really have time to go into it. China shouldn't be viewed as our enemy. The people of China don't even know what's going on. They, they have no way of know, knowing what's going on because YouTube is censored there. Those citizens, can't you feel sorry for them? All right, next article. Jay Carney refuses to answer if White House will cooperate with select committee. Democrats are already threatening to boycott any hearings or investigation. Uh, I bet this is about Benghazi. Yeah, they obviously have something to hide. The government does. Uh, Obama, Hillary, yeah, they knew about all that. They were responsible for the ambassador's death. And al-Qaeda uh, did it. Al-Qaeda's remedy is government. Okay, um, another uh, NYT sort of retraction on Ukraine. All they found were Eastern Ukrainian Ukrainians upset by the coup regime in Kiev that replaced President Viktor Yanukovych. Well, like I said, it's the thing with Ukraine, we should be concerned now the FBI and the CIA is meddling in the affairs there, and our founding fathers never would have wanted that to happen by any stretch of the imagination. Our country going in foreign affairs and war unless we are attacked. All right, so without further ado, I see we have two more numbers on. I'm assuming these are my guests. So um, area code 949 and area code 917, you are both on the air. Is this Jason and Amish? Yes, yes it is. is. This is Jason Martell. Yes, how are you doing? Amish. And is Amish Shah, you're the colleague of Jason, who I'm uh, pleased to meet for the first time to hear about your findings in India with this Dwarka documentary. Is that you, area code 917? Yes, it is. Hey, everyone, it's Amish Shah here. Yeah, how you doing? So it's great to be talking Good. to you again. Um, special yeah, exception, yeah. letting letting the same guest on my show twice in the case of Jason because he wanted to come on to discuss bindings. That's perfectly understandable. I may do the same thing with Frank Joseph Hoff in uh, maybe a year or so when some of that pyramid in Indonesia that's being unearthed is um, unearthed. He wants to do that too. But today it's going to be about um, the documentary Dwarka, which talks about ruins being uncovered in India 
and also uh, pertains to cycles of time and astrological cycles. Jason talked about that in my last interview with him, and uh, very interesting idea. It's so obviously in your face that the ancients knew about cycles. So um, I guess um, I'll let you guys decide who wants to do the talking, but I'm interested to know what this documentary is all about, specifically what it's about in regards to India. I, I think I'd like to just give a quick Twitter uh, intro to the topics and then kind of let Amish uh, dive right into the Dwarka documentary. Thanks, Andrew. You did a, a good job there of explaining it. And first of all, I'd, I'd like to give you accolades for your show. You have a very unique style as a radio host, and I got a lot of compliments from our last show uh, in the way that we discussed the topics. Um, uh, again, I, I, again, I just think you have a very unique way of approaching these topics and while it might differ in some of my views, that's great. It makes it open um, discussion for us to have, you know, a clear and honest topic that we can't always agree on but can approach it from many sides. So I definitely like to dive back into that overall understanding of the megalithic sites and the larger cycle of time that we're just now learning about that over 30 ancient cultures were aware of. But as you mentioned, Andrew, yes, in, in tonight's show, and thank you so much for having me back on, uh, Amish is a, a gentleman that I've partnered with. We've started a new community called Ancient Explorers, and kind of as a launch to our new platform and explaining what we're doing, Amish is going to kind of dive right into our first documentary where Amish went firsthand to India and discovered this lost city of a potential underwater kingdom, if you will, and I'm going to kind of just pass it over to him and we'll ping pong back and forth, but very interesting story that we have uh, on the city of Dwarka. Okay, by the way, Amish uh, went off the air for a brief moment. I hope that's not a connection problem, but you are back on the air, Amish, so hopefully you won't get kicked off. Uh, do the talking. You got the floor. Yep. Yeah, so this uh, this lost kingdom off the west coast of India, you know, if we look at the map of India, we always kind of see that piece that sticks out on the on the kind of top left corner, there, the middle kind of left over there. And that piece is the state of Gujarat that's within India. And there's a city of Dwarka that's off the coast of Gujarat. Um, Dwarka was once considered a mythical uh, place, but there was a modern city called Dwarka. Dwarka was actually found in many references in ancient scriptures as an ancient city or the city of Lord Krishna, so they say. You know, again, it was written in the Mahabharata, and um, they they always thought it was myth mythical for the longest time because of some of the things that were written inside of this scripture. Um, the world's longest poem, and it's about a war, it's a battle actually that takes place where four million soldiers are said to have died in just a couple of days in this city of Dwarka. Now, you start to look at some of these events that take place, and again, you start thinking, okay, is this mythical? Is this some story, or what's it up? In the 60s, they started doing excavations in modern-day Dwarka, and the reason why is because Dr. S.R. Rao, who was leading the excavations at the time in India, found a wall. It was a 550-meter wall. And this wall um, was coming up basically on shore. It was on shore. He was like, wow, this is interesting. This is a whole entire kind of city that's, that's under uh, the ocean or the ground here. So they started excavating in the 60s. Sure enough, they started finding more and more stuff. They started unearthing all kinds of stuff from pottery to stone anchors. Um, they found um, some amazing, amazing artifacts that have to do with, um, they're called mudras. And mudras are a form of identification that were also spoken about in the Mahabharata and another scripture, an ancient Vedic scripture. Now, this was interesting because that's when S.R. Rao was like, okay, well, this can't all just be myth. You know, if this city that we're finding evidence of off the coast of India that's called Dwarka is becoming this real city that we're discovering, they found a temple that went back to 900, around 900 to 1000 A.D., and they're finding more and more older stuff as they go further out to sea. Now, in the 90s, they stopped 
the excavations, late 90s, early 2000s. Now, why they stopped the excavations still is kind of a mystery, and that's what got me intrigued really about Dwarka, is because if they found some stuff that was carbon dated, you know, 7,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, and just going about 50 feet down into the water, discovering things from 3,000 B.C., um, imagine what you would discover if you went further. And one of their sonar scans of the area actually produced an image that was twice the size of the Manhattan that's off the coast of Dwarka. There's a metropolis, basically, that, that existed, um, and it's still there. They did a sonar scan. They, they, it looks very, very similar to other ancient locations and just haven't gone out and researched. Now, that's all fine. That's all good. And then, you know, that was all cool. But what really fortified this story, um, besides just the archaeological evidence, like, okay, maybe it was a mythical city and it's still just another city by coincidence. The thing that really tied it all together, and Jason mentioned this before, is the cycles of time a little bit and what we've been discovering with the cycles of time. Um, the cycles of time are absolutely, like, amazing because these ancient scriptures that we find not just in dated history but all over every culture, they've always used the stars and the heaven as a way to keep time, as a way to keep track of um, events that are happening at the time. And so there were um, 137 references in the Mahabharata of astronomical references. Dr. Narahari, Narahari Achar from the University of Memphis took those references and backdated all of them using astronomy software, various pieces of astronomy software. And the exact conjunction of those planets with the moons and the stars and everything in constellations led back to 3067 B.C. that this city of Dwarka existed. Now... The city of Dwarka was where Lord Krishna was said to have lived. This is where his, this is his abode. This was where, his, where he had, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of palaces. And these palaces were made out of gold. And there was gold, like, everywhere. And it was just an abundant, abundant city. Heaven on earth, if you, if you want to call it, basically. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pause there and let Jason kind of jump in a little bit about the, the time a little bit sure. and to give you a little bit broader perspective of time and how that works. And then we can get into some of the more like interesting subjects as to, you know, my discoveries there, some of the more research I've done about ancient technology. I guess we can kind of get into that in a little bit. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Thanks, Amish. I'd love to jump in <clears throat> if that's okay, Andrew, unless you had something you'd like, like to say off of Misha's comments. No, nothing in particular. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, Amish brings up some interesting points around, you know, the artifacts and, and, and things that we can we can come back to. Um, and, and one of those points, obviously, <clears throat> when we talk about evidence is, you know, a lot of these ancient cultures seem to be using a, a calendar system, a way of running their daily lives and future events by a system of time that was much more accurate than, than what we use today. And it appears that over 30 ancient cultures used astronomical references for their calendar system. And today we're just learning and kind of piercing the envelope on this topic, and it's something we call the precession of the equinox. And this is embedded in all the ancient cultures with high information. Even the Hindus, you know, when we're talking about this city of Dwarka, there's some really interesting parallels here, Andrew, because... In the time of 3000 B.C., this is literally in the Mahabharata speaking about Lord Krishna actually occupying the city of Dwarka. 3000 B.C. is the same, the same time frame where over in the Middle East we have today's southern-day Iraq. Uh, in that same time frame of 30, um, 3000 B.C., we have the Sumerian civilization interacting with their living gods, just like the Bible today talks about there was once a giants upon the earth, those are epochs coming out of ancient Sumer, which again, in 3000 B.C., we have these beings called the Anunnaki interacting with ancient Iraqis, if you will. Um, so the Sumerian 
scriptures of these gods visiting man literally correlate um, to the same time frame of the Mahabharata tales of Lord Krishna. And what we can do is start to use astronomical references, just like these major ancient cultures did, to pinpoint specific dates. So, Andrew, we're trying to try out new science that is basically in alignment with mainstream science, but unfortunately outside of their view and scope to make these types of connections. It appears that way, at least. Otherwise, they'd be touting this in the news. Simply put, you can use the astronomical time frame of megalithic sites and information and what we call sacred texts that we now think of as mythology. They talk about specific moons or, or views of the sky, artifacts that have been left to us, like the Dendera Zodiac in Egypt and many others that show specific astronomical references of viewpoints in the heavens. What you would see on Earth if you were looking up in the sky at certain time frames. Now this is really key because we can use astronomical software like Redshift and others that you can run on your iPad or your computer today and it will tell you where the stars are going to be uh, in your view of the heavens tonight, in a week from today, or 10,000 years in the past. So we can use this as a model to understand some of the encoded information in these megalithic sites. Then, Andrew, we add another layer of academic information, which is geological evidence. And there are sites like in Peru and Bolivia, uh, Lake Titicaca is an example, famous sites like Sacsayhuaman, uh, Puma Punku, Teotihuacan. These all used to lap up on the shores of Lake Titicaca, where this now has receded, and we can look at the geological evidence for the time frame it would take for these waters to recede. Same thing in Egypt. If we look at where the Nile is now, anyone can pull up Google Maps right now as I'm telling you this, and you can see where the Nile is now compared to where it was at one point right up on the shore of the three great pyramids of Giza, lapping the shoreline. That doesn't happen now. You can see the vast distance that the Nile has meandered away from the three pyramids. Again, geological evidence to date how long it would take for that type of meandering of the Nile to move. So there are patterns that we can look at with astronomical references, geological evidence, and literally start to pinpoint sites like Dwarka and others to understand a clearer picture of some type of lost culture that influenced all the great civilizations we look to today, like the Mayans, Egyptians, Sumerians. They were all influenced by some great culture that we're now starting to discover. Right, right. But the thing that um, concerns a lot of people is getting the dating right, because uh, I'd like to elaborate on this a bit. Michael Cremo, who will probably have a field day with this radio show, I hope he listens to it, um, he uh, discussed in my interview with him that the Vedic text, the Sanskrit text, say human history has gone back many millions of years, even to the time of the dinosaurs human history has. And Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartzis has talked about how there were many different Atlantises and Lemurias that all rose and fall. In regards to dating, um, there is an unwritten rule in mainstream science that is so flawed, saying that you date the fossils by the rock layers they're in, and you date the rock layers by the age of the fossils that are in those rock layers. Well, that obviously doesn't make any sense, but that's the way they are supposed to do it. And, well, this shows that our whole dating system can be totally flawed. So elaborate on the date of this unearthing that's going on in India, and how can you be sure that the date that you think it is is the true date that is its age? So that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, and what we're finding in India, obviously, we do carbon datable, you know, and then that being itself a whole slew of questions, um, then we use the astronomy. You know, we use the astronomy of the scriptures of the Mahabharata itself as written written events of things that were happening. And so these events um, have astrological conjunctions written along with them. This is what's happening with the moon. This is where Jupiter is. This is what constellation it's in. This is, you know, a comet that might have occurred that night or something that's happening. All of that stuff has been recorded and has been put into these scriptures. So you start to look at them, and you 
you backdate them. And it came out to 3067 B.C. was the year of that great war that took place in Dwarka. And this great war was just not a regular war. It was a, it was a very um, a big cataclysmic war, um, almost to some extent, because they say four million soldiers were said to have died. Now, what's uh, interesting about this is that not just that, when we start to dig a little bit further, you know, in the Mahabharata itself, we match that with the mudra. So we have artifacts that we found, we have carbon date, um, you know, carbon dated different things that they've carbon, carbon dated from Dwarka. We have the astrological, sorry, astronomical references that they reference um, within these scriptures themselves. And then lastly, you know, one of the things is the government and when I went out there and just what I experienced while I was out there trying to dig up more information and it just kind of seemed why are they trying to do this and you know in the city of Dwarka or, or the village of Dwarka many thousands of years ago they say that there was this great war and King Shelva came down um, and he asked the gods um, for a machine which he could attack the city of Dwarka. These machines are often common, commonly referred to as Vimana. And these Vimanas um, come in various forms. Some are controlled by sound, some are controlled um, by your internal being, controlling your, your internal senses. Um, and there are quite literally Vimanas that are aerial in, that in, in style. And they talk about them shooting weapons. King Shalva would come with his machine or, or for outer space, whatever you want to call it, he asks the heavens to give it, you know, to him. And he comes and he attacks the city of Dwarka. Um, as he's attacking Dwarka, it was said that Lord Krishna had shot a ground-to-air missile um, at the aircraft and shot it into the ground, or I should say into the waters, basically, that are off the coast of Dwarka. Now... If all of this proof is leading up to that this city existed and this proof that this is from this scripture, and the scripture also talks about some of these advanced technologies of some sort, that that's the best way that they could describe it. Um, they said that, you know, it came through the sky like a roaring comet. Um, and this machine, and this Sobapura, they called it, would appear in one place or appear in two places at a certain time, or it would just disappear altogether. Uh, and it was, it was quite interesting as you start un, unlayering some of these texts and you're like, okay, wait, there's astrological reference, sorry, astronomical reference, and there's all these other proof elements that are trying to prove that this is truly the city that, this, this, that existed thousands of years ago. And um, when I went out there and I, I started asking some of these questions, I was like, what, what is this? What is it all about? And why did the excavation stop? And, you know, that, that, that was my biggest question going out there. It's like, look, if, if you found stuff that, you know, goes back to 7,000 BC, 12,000 BC, or even older, um, even 3,000 BC, and I'm sorry, even newer, 3,000 BC, why wouldn't you want to discover more? And I was always just, um, given not a proper answer. They were just saying that it was, uh, the scope of the project was done. And so that's what led me to really go out there and discover more and make this documentary um, and this film about, about my experience and what we can do to kind of unearth more of this kind of information and discover really what was going on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching it when it comes out. But I want to talk about uh, stellar alignments because many different cultures have aligned their uh, ancient structures to model the stars, but some constellations mm -hmm. are more prominent than others. In the case of India, do you have any information on which star systems and constellations that the uh, people of India were fascinated with? So the Indian Vedic astrology is based off of uh, what it's what they call Jyotisha, and it's uh, it's actually not completely sun focused. It's actually moon focused. So in the West, we often reference things focused around the sun and our zodiac symbols around the sun. So, uh, for example, in Western zodiac, you know, I am a Capricorn. In Vedic astrology, I am a Cancer, according to my moon sign. 
um, and that is pretty much what they follow for the most part. And not just that, their, their astrological mappings have always been based on um, very advanced constellations and then the reading of the constellations. So when you go and you fill out your, it's actually quite literally based on when you're born and the location you're born and your name, and it's a combination. And then they, they, that astrological mapping is basically what they believe in. That is who you are, and that's who you are on this planet. You, you know, based upon the constellations. Um, and they've always seen the universes as lokas. So it's what they call lokas. And these lokas are, I believe there's seven of them. And there's seven upper and there's seven lower. And they say that there's all universes, like, you know, total of 13, I believe, universes. And these universes all have billions of galaxies. And, you know, they talk about the yugas. And these yugas, again, like you mentioned, Michael Cremo, they go on for billions, I mean, billions of years and millions of years. And, you know, they, all of this stuff has been recorded. And you're just sitting there, like, kind of scratching your head. And you're like, really? Right. You know, some of the numbers they talk about are just fascinating. And one more it's thing over the really top. Cool. I, I, uh, I hope I'm not cutting you off, Amish, but I, I agree with everything that you're bringing up mm-hmm. about these ancient cycles. And unfortunately, it's, it's so overwhelming to hear this information. Uh, <clears throat> people always try to look for some type of reference. And, you know, we have to understand that the Mahabharata is literally one of the oldest texts on Earth. And there are some interesting parallels between information that we can prove with our sciences versus information that's recorded in sacred texts like the Mahabharata that we would consider today as mythology are starting to be proved as fact. The Mahabharata shares information with many other cultures like the Greeks and even our modern day understandings of the procession of the equinox, Sumerian culture. They all seem to have this understanding of an astronomical clock. And at least to put it into perspective so that people realize that it's you know it's not just these ancient Hindu texts the Hindus broke down this cycle, what what Plato called the Great Year, into different epochs that lasted over thousands of years. And we can get more specific in understanding this, but for the very simple layman, you know, we're talking about something that's the procession of the equinox, and all the ancients were aware of this cycle. It's a 24,000-year cycle. And as, as Amish was saying, the the Hindu texts really even speak back to a time of these great seers. I think they were called rishis that were mm-hmm. able to somehow literally through meditation and deep internal uh, focus were able to tap into some type of knowledge. Literally, the best way I can dis- explain it is they were downloading something from the universe and literally explained these cycles of time. But they were they were getting it from this enlightened state through meditation that today we would look at and go, what are we, come on, that's not possible. Unfortunately, it seems to be extremely accurate as our sciences are proving. So the Indian and Hindu versions talk about this cycle as, you know, people have heard of the Golden Age or the Dark Ages. Again, Plato called this the great year. So several different cultures, again, over 30 reference this cycle. The Hindus broke it down into the uh, Kali Yuga. They were called Yuga cycles. So there was the Kali Yuga, the Dwapara Yuga, the Treta Yuga, and then the Satya Yuga, which is kind of like the Golden Age. Amish might correct me a little bit on the exact pronunciations there. Um, You're pretty good. But what's, pretty in- good. <laughs> All right. but what's interesting about those words I just said, the yuga cycles, is they fit exactly with the Greek understandings of what they called the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the Silver and Golden Age. Whereas today, we call it the procession of the equinox. We've divided the heavens into 12 constellations that are specific zodiacal symbols. And... Very simply, folks, it appears that 
every 2,000 years, we move into a new zodiacal symbol. And this was common knowledge to the ancients. Right now, we're in the age of Pisces. Everyone's seen that little symbol on the back of people's cars that's a fish, maybe a little cross within the fish. And that's symbolizing Jesus and his giving of the fish. But we have to understand that there's an older epoch of understanding of the Pisces symbol with a fish far before Jesus, thousands of years in our past. And this really raises a lot of questions for us to try and understand this cycle of time that's embedded in monuments around the world. And that's kind of our focus at Ancient Explorers is to visit these sites and further shed light on this lost cycle of time to see possibly what we have in store for us in the near future. Okay, and um, you said that uh, in regards to the government, um, in regards to excavation of what's going on in India, on the first ever episode of Ancient Aliens that aired back in 2009, Giorgio Tsoukalos once said that he would be out of a job in India in regards to trying to find a job for extraterrestrial work. Because wow, you're if good. He was, yeah, where he talked about that in India, the people would say, so what else is new? Because um, extraterrestrial mythology is so ingrained in their culture that they think there's nothing unusual about it, which is kind of ironic, because here in the land of the free, if you talk about extraterrestrials, they call you a crackpot, uh, which is kind of pathetic. <laughs> so, but, um, but they are more open-minded about it in India, and I'm interested to know how open-minded the government of India is, because, you know, governments try to keep things from us. So how do they get involved in this? Well, it's, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, if, if there was an extraterrestrial or there was some kind of advanced technology or if, it, if there was proof that something advanced lived or was on Earth at one point, it could drastically shift a lot of um, religion and politics would get shaken up, I believe. Um, and I think that is probably the biggest reason um, it, it's one option. The other option is they found something, and it's just kind of like, okay, that's it, cool, we found what we need to find, and we're going to play with this for a little while. Um, or three, they 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 just don't care, ignorance um, and, and politics, you know. Um, I know it's definitely not a funding issue because I asked um, the Archaeological Survey of India directly um, in, the, in, in, in one of the interviews that I did in India, if there was a funding issue, and he's like, no. He's like, there's no funding issue at all. And in fact, in, India is getting more archaeological funding than ever. And so I was like, huh, okay, well, that's weird. And so, you know, my journey just kind of led me to believe that it's going to take more of us to kind of go in there and, and get some of the get some of the permits that we want and just go out there and do it, and, you know. Jason mentioned the Ancient Explorers, and that's really the mission of what, what Ancient Explorers is um, and how, we're gonna, how we want to approach situations like that and, and actually protect, protect places like that and, and research places like that. Okay, and I want to talk for a little bit about how uh, religion plays into all of this. Um, I personally am, am of the belief it's not a good idea to take up a religion because re religions, even though they teach benevolent things, uh, suppress your consciousness. But that's beside exactly. the point for this. The, the, the point no, of this is, in, in regards to uh, religion in India, uh, many of the structures that are being unearthed in India, are they directly correlated with uh, in some sort of religious aspects or are the majority of them not connected to religious at all? They're just structures that were built for some other purpose. Well, some of the stuff that they're unearthing, I wouldn't necessarily say they're for religious purposes. Um, I think what it is is that India has various different caste systems in place still. Yes, it's still... Uh, you know, still catching up, um, and the democratic society is just starting to be built, and infrastructure is just starting to be integrated into a lot of the rural parts of India. So you see a little bit of uh, slowness, and, and not slowness, but adapting, adapting to, you know, modern-day world. So with, with that, you have so many different states that speak so many different languages. I believe India has over 100 different dialects that they speak, you can go to, you know, you can fly an hour and a half away and you won't even know what someone's saying. 
um, because they don't even speak the national language. So that is still something that is an issue as well. So with that comes many, 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 many belief systems um, and comes with many, 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 many religious tie-ins with some of these belief systems of who Krishna might have been, whether he was a man, a god, an alien, or whatever you want to call it, everyone has a different perception of who that is or what that is. And, you know, many people, even next door, basically, is, is Pakistan. You have Pakistan next door. Um, and, you know, so it, it, could, it could be interesting what happens. I don't know exactly what would happen, but it's, uh, it's something to think about. Hey, Amish, I mean, what, what I'm hearing you say there makes me think of another person of biblical veracity that, you know, I grew up with here in North America. And his name's Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But everyone has a different interpretation based on the specific sect of your religion. Mm -hmm. you know, I was raised as uh, just, you know, as a Christian. Um, but there are many different facets that look at Jesus in a different spectrum, even though it's the same guy. So that's very fascinating that you bring up that point. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. And, you know, what's interesting about Hindus um, specifically is that there's many, there's so many different forms. Some are more philosophical based. Some are very religious, ritual based. Some, you know, and then there's various things in between. So there's so many different facets to this. Yeah, and, and on a related note to religion, it's interesting to point out that in his most uh, recent book, The Perception Deception, David Icke el elaborated on how all the religions, virtually all the religions, are actually correlated in some way with the planet Saturn. He even acknowledged in one of his talks, I was wrong when I said a lot of symbolism is sun symbolism. It's actually Saturn symbolism. Like whenever you see a crescent around a circle or a star, that's Saturn symbolism. He claims that like thousands of years ago, Saturn uh, had a luminous crescent around it and whatnot, and also like rings around um, depictions. That's also Saturn symbolism. But uh, specifically to Saturn, can you do you know of any um, stuff in the uh, things uncovered in India, the artifacts that you could interpret as Saturn symbolism? So that's interesting you say that. That's really wow. Okay, that's uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, correlation there that you just pulled up. Saturn, the Great War was taking place when Saturn was. Um, in retrograde motion, I believe, in Antares in 3067 BC. It's generally tied in with um, big events, such as 9 11 was a Saturn retrogression in, ast in um, astronomically. So you start looking at some of these events, and there may be some correlations to them. I could certainly with Saturn believe that. Specifically. Andrew, you're probably touching on something at much more of an esoteric level than yeah. even all three of us. But I will tell you that, look, the astronomical data, whether it befounds you, myself, or Amish, I'm hooked. I'm clearly able to see that there are references that use this system of time of astronomical references. But I'm more interested in the positive aspects. But I will acknowledge there's probably negative ones as well. Well, don't assume that Saturn is all negative. That is a stereotype in some regards. People want to stress there are some uh, good things about Saturn, like it's a determination and all astrologically speaking. But sure, um, sure. I want, yeah, I want, yeah. but I want to switch gears. Astrologically speaking, you know, I yeah. believe every planet has its energy and good, bad, whatever you want to call it. But I want to uh, switch gears now and really get really into the sure. the controversial stuff. Extraterrestrials. Okay, so what kind of ET races were involved in India? To the best of your knowledge and ability, please elaborate. Do you want uh, Do you want to go, Jason, or do you want me to? Yeah, I think I was. <laughs> but I guess you. I'm up to bat there. Well, here's what I could say as far as India's involvement with extraterrestrials. You know, this is first of all when any time we talk about extraterrestrials, Andrew, as you and I. Um, had more of a heated discussion in our last interview, extraterrestrials for someone like myself is a difficult topic. Even though I'm on a show called Ancient Aliens, I have to use artifacts and evidence, things I can physically place my hands on, whether it be a person or an actual physical location or a piece of evidence. And if it's not that, I can't use it in my information to move the needle of human understanding. The extraterrestrial topic 
is rather difficult to explain. But if anyone studies the field of ufology, there are there is a plethora of information to go through. So what I would comment on about things having to do with extraterrestrials in India would be more or less from my personal opinion of things that I've looked into versus the evidence I can provide to move the human understanding of the needle. Making that clear, there's been some very interesting information coming out of the Freedom of Information Act uh, in you know classified documents that have been released over 50 years, even though most of them are still blacked out. But there are references to these gray beings, these small figurine-looking, you know, bulbous heads, large almond black eyes, these beings that, when interacting with Indian culture and Hinduism, found that they liked two things. One, they very much liked Hindu culture, and they very much also liked strawberry ice cream. Now, as weird as that sounds, anyone who has actually done the research or looked into this sees that there are ufological references to the greys being very much in tune with Indian and Hindu culture, finding these people more acceptable, and also liking strawberry ice cream. Take that with what you, what you will. Okay, you did um, mention the greys there. But um, besides the greys, there's also other races of ETs that come in conversation, like reptilian races and Nordic races with blonde hair and, and whatnot, and also some insectoid races. Um, is it possible for you to maybe elaborate on some of those other races besides greys at all? Sure. If not, I'll just I, well, move on. But go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, I, real, real quickly, I'm sorry. Did you direct that to Amish? Um, I, I, I'm actually kind of directing it to both of you. I'll let you guys guide okay. decide who's the best guy to take the answer. Well, I'd, sure. to, I'd love I, I, I to can elaborate a little bit after. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no, uh, but I'll just I'll just say one thing further, guys. Uh, uh, yeah, there are references, obviously, around the world from various cultures to different types of beings, and it's kind of hard to decipher which ones are, you know, the same race being identified by seven different cultures. Obviously, the greys or this large bulbous head-looking being is um, mentioned over and over. Um, but there are references as an example that kind of get our attention, and I'll just give this one and then turn it over to Amish. If we look at all the South American cultures and their gods like Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan, um, most South American people are dark hair, dark skin. And if we look at their gods, Kukulkan, Quetzalcoatl, again, uh, most of these are depicted as red hair, pale skin, or even blonde hair. So why is it that their god of a Native American people would have genetic characteristics not in alignment with them? This raises a lot of flags, but we see this same pattern around the world. Amisha, any thoughts on yeah. extraterrestrial yeah. cultures? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I mean... From from my understanding, you know, I, again, I agree with everything that you're saying, Jason, is uh, definitely from my personal opinion and kind of just what I've researched. Outside of just extraterrestrial type of um, life that you can say, like from other planets, there's also been countless things, like you said, of um, just different types of beings, such as in the some of the Vedic scriptures, they talk about um, Nagas, and the Nagas are a lizard race that lived upon the earth at one point. Um, and, you know, they talk about all these different kinds of um, different kinds of, of cultures that exist, or they have a god, for example, that, that came, and they say that that's another discovery that just happened recently, was uh, Hanuman, who was a it was a clan of intelligent monkeys that could build a bridge, and they built a bridge from India to Sri Lanka, and there's NASA image um, showing that this bridge actually exists and that this bridge was actually built. So again, it leads you to wonder: Did these creatures exist, or was it just, were they just saying that they looked like monkeys and they could they were big and that they could build these walls? Um, you know, in the water and, and build a bridge. Now, I don't really know, um, but I think every ancient culture also talks about that, such as a god with, you know, um, their representations, or they could be real things, basically. 
And okay, if, that's what I was. All right, we need to mm -hmm. um, touch on the subject of construction, constructing these um, megalithic structures, or else the skeptics will always say, "How could uh, cultures that had no wheel, no pulley, no iron, and like all that, have possibly constructed these things?" Well, the consensus is, well, either they got it from extraterrestrials, or somehow, some way, they obtained acoustic, sonic technology to move objects using sound or something like that, or even um, you uh, had a great high consciousness ability to use a telekinesis uh, if you're that open-minded. But we need to cover this so the skeptics can't get us. How can they construct these megalithic structures all these years ago when they didn't have technology? Well, that is a really good question, and that's definitely, again, why Amish and I are kind of putting together our resources and forming ancient explorers is we want to go on location to a lot of these sites, just like Amish did at Dwarka. Um, so, Andrew, to answer your question, you know, sites like Puma Punku and Sekse Huaman, Machu Picchu, even Giza and the Three Greek Pyramids, what we're seeing is really things that raise a lot of flags. One is the architecture of a lot of these monuments. They, they literally have built monuments like the Three Great Pyramids at Giza, They've built them to align little tiny shafts, little narrow shafts, literally embedded through the pyramid that point to a specific star constellation at a certain time. It's a repeating astronomical alignment. Somehow, building a lot of these monuments around the world, they'd, they'd have to have a knowledge of precession, understanding that the, there are movements in the heavens that aren't like you can just pick a point in the sky and know that a week from now it's going to be at that same point. It's, it's very complicated. So it raises a lot of questions that megalithic sites around the world are built to specific, uh, built to specific alignments that literally repeat over thousands of years, and they seem to be tied to this larger cycle of time, this 24,000-year cycle. It's actually a really simple mathematical breakdown from a high level. If we understand the precession of the equinox, as we call it now, is just the 12 zodiacal symbols that we have in the heavens. And every 2,000 years, we move through a new zodiacal symbol. So that's a 24,000-year cycle. But combined with that, we have what appears to be a cycle here on Earth that causes the rise and fall of civilization. Now, people have heard of it as the Dark Ages or the Golden Age. What's really important, Andrew, is that all of these megalithic sites, all the great ones that we know of today, seem to be used to be either monitoring this larger cycle or to at least commemorate knowledge of this larger cycle. And there are even artifacts beyond just monuments, artifacts, like as I mentioned earlier in the show, Dendera in Egypt. Anyone can Google the Dendera Zodiac. And what you see is this unbelievable set of hieroglyphs that are carved into this crypt on the wall of Dendera. And essentially, Andrew, what it shows is the skies above Egypt at 8000 B.C. Now, the Egyptian culture was supposed to have existed and built the pyramids in 2500 B.C., so, the Dendera Zodiac raises the question that either the Egyptians are pointing with very accurate, again, astronomical references of knowledge to a much older epoch of time to say that's when they were in their golden age. Or, their culture is much older than 2500 BC, which is the likely conclusion. So, it's really important that we understand this the zodiacal breakdown of the heavens into the 12 houses of the zodiacs, and that all the ancient cultures, literally over 30 of them, respected this celestial clock and built great edifices and monuments to commemorate this knowledge because it seems to literally affect the rise and fall of civilizations here on Earth. And that's a, that's a deep topic that even in show number two, we're not going to be able to fully cover but it's a continuing quest and, and, and a motto for ancient explorers, whether it be Dwarka or other sites. They all tie into this lost sacred knowledge that the ancient cultures seem to possess, and we're just scratching the surface today. 
Okay, um, just so you know, we have about eight minutes left, so I want to try to quickly cover two more subjects before I let you guys finish up. Um, how does the work of what you're doing in regards to the structures being unearthed in India tie in with either the planet Nibiru and or Atlantis and Lemuria? Does it tie in at all? And if it does, please cover that. Okay, uh, well, I'd give Amish a chance to chime in on this in a second, but I'll just mm -hmm. quickly say that Dwarka is – Again, one of the new sites that's, uh, you know, a new blip on the radar, if you will, of these megalithic sites around the world that seem to speak of some lost culture that influenced all the great civilizations. As far as Planet X or Nibiru, let's just say that if we look at the Sumerian information as being accurate and the biblical original tales of why there was a great flood, Dwarka is a perfect example to look at an era that goes back 10 to 13,000 B.C., possibly even later. But there's geological evidence to suggest a great flood took place 10,000, 13,000 B.C. And if that was the case, most of these ancient kingdoms, like Dwarka, could have been submerged at that time. The cause of this great flood, the biblical tales that we have in English are a consolidated version of these Sumerian epics that, as you mentioned, speak of a planet X that passed by our planet very close in ancient times and caused this great flood. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future, but definitely Dwarka, if there is this, as, as Amish said, a, a, an underwater city that's twice the size of Manhattan off the coast of India, maybe we can find fragments of blown up vimanas or take further astronomical evidence to pinpoint dates of things that took place in our past. Okay, Mish, you want to say anything about that? Sure. Um so, you know, we always we always have like, you know, Atlantis and Lumeria and some of these lost things that we talk about, these lost kingdoms. Um Dwarka is definitely an interesting one because they have talked about a flood um, submerging Dwarka at the, uh, when Lord Krishna had departed Earth, basically. Um, and the waters, um, submerged the city of Dwarka, and we see that amongst all of these, um, ancient cultures, you know, and so, you know, I don't, I don't know, without any factual proof to, you know, really look into anything, and one can only make like some, you know, hypothesis of, hypothesis if that's a word um and you know what we can see is that that great flood has been told many 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 times across many many cultures and so if i was to you know really say was there a lost kingdom or is there something deeper in that area you know that, that we can go and excavate that might be between egypt and india in that whole area, and even the Gulf of Kambe, which is a little bit lower, um, kind of underneath um, in India, I think we would find some pretty pretty interesting things that will show us um, some more about our history. Okay, we got about uh, four and a half minutes left, so we got time for another subject. Uh, sunken cities around India in the uh, Indian Ocean area, can you discuss that at all, you guys? So, um, if there's anything sunken cities in the Indian Ocean, you know, um, we always, we, we, we look at kind of <laughs> what we see right here with Dwarka, which is kind of, kind of there. Um, and the Indian Ocean is so vast and so big. Um, I think, you know, if, if uh, Jason has anything to, to say, I, I'm not really sure what to add here. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, as you as you touched on, the Gulf of Cambay and a 200-mile radius of Dwarka is, again, mm -hmm. probably a connected site. And Yanaguni in Japan, and there are probably various other sites around the world that are still underwater. And Andrew, as an example, we really need to deploy some partnerships with some of the people that have technology, whether that be sea drones or aerial drones or even companies like NASA. If you realize that NASA is struggling as a company and it's not even launching space packages anymore, they still have a very vast array in the scientific arm 
in discovering Earth-based technologies. They've developed something called synthetic aperture radar, and as Amish and I have discussed, you know, they recently, a couple of years ago, deployed synthetic aperture radar over Cambodia. It's essentially a big 747 packed with all this technology. They fly it over areas like Cambodia, and it has ground-penetrating radar where they found under some jungles, uh, you know, shrubbery and such, that literally just buried underneath the ground were these pyramids that no one was aware of. So there's there's possibly technology that we have today that we can partner with the right other companies and investigate areas like Dwarka, whether it be, again, with drones or ground-penetrating radar, and start to further collaborate that there's something off the grid still now. There is some lost culture that we're starting to pick up the pieces now and see that they were influencing all the great civilizations that we look to now, Egyptians, Mayans, and Toltecs, Sumerians, Hindu, um, all of these ancient cultures seem to have some type of influence and reference to a lost civilization and beings that are always described as utilizing technology and flying in the heavens where ancient man described it as more of a spiritual layer rather than today refocusing on this, this information with a technological lens rather than a spiritual one to say that, wow, a lot of the references that they describe sound like modern technology that we're very familiar with today. Okay, so unfortunately we don't have time to discuss any further subjects, but uh, um, you, I, uh, Jason, you wrote something on my Skype thing here that there's a, right after the show, a live question and answer session. Can you tell the audience about that quickly? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to let Amish uh, fill you in there, but uh, yeah, sure. we have a live Q&A coming up. Amish, uh, give us the details. Yeah, for everyone that's listening right now, uh, if you want to check out, you know, um, ancientexplorers.com, and just sign up for the free screening. We're having an encore screening of the film right now, actually starting at 6 o'clock, and we're going to have that open to watch the movie until 12 o'clock today. And then we're also doing a live Q&A, Jason and I, um, at 7 o'clock, um, so that if there's any questions, you know, you can watch the movie for the next, uh, you know, hour or so, and then Jason and I will be around to answer any questions and uh, some things like that. So, yeah. That's what we're up to today. More than happy to have any of anyone join. So, okay, we're actually. What time are you talking about there? What time zone are you referring to? Oh, I'm in Pacific time zone, so 6 p.m. Pacific and um, Tuesday, May 6th, obviously. 